It seems like every time you find a video you want to stream, you're being asked to subscribe to a monthly pay service. Carla Reads the Classics is totally free. No fees and no passwords to remember. But since Carla isn't employed by a big multimedia conglomerate, she does appreciate any help you can give her. Carla has an ongoing need to improve her recording equipment and other expenses, so your kind donation is appreciated. Visit anchor.fm slash Carla3507. You're probably there right now. Just click the button Support. We appreciate Carla and she appreciates you. Visit anchor.fm slash Carla3507 or cash app dollar sign Jess TSM. Hi, everybody. Carla here with take five, I believe, of me trying to deliver this message without saying a hundred ums and ahs. I don't know if I'll get through it, but I'm going to give it a try. Now, if I'm reading something, I can generally get through it okay. I'll, I'll make a few flubs here and there, and I generally try to apologize for those. But if I'm just talking like I am now, I make so many mistakes. It's just really difficult for me to talk without messing up. So anyway, I'm going to slow down a bit and try to deliver my message here. First, it, first of all, let me say thank you, first of all, for clicking on the Carla Reads the Classics podcast. And I extend you the greetings of the season. And I hope you're really having a fantastic day today. I hope you enjoyed Flowers for Algernon. That's a really moving story. And I so enjoyed reading it. Before I continue with a new reading, I'd just like to say a couple of things, if I may. First, please rate this podcast, if you would please, whether you view it as a one, a five, or anywhere in between, please rate it to help others decide if they might enjoy this content. I've had this podcast program for 16 months now, and I really enjoy what I'm doing, but I know there's so much room for improvement here. And because I don't have commercial sponsorships on my program like others do, I have to appeal to you directly for contributions or donations. My goal is to improve and expand the broadcast, the technical components of it, and also the overall quality of it. Um, ah, there I go again with the, um, I started doing this because I just enjoy reading and I wanted to share great literature with people, but I'm finding out that it's had some other impact too. And I'll just share a couple of those with you. I've gotten messages from some people who say that, uh, and these are students who say that the readings, uh, help them to process the stories better than they would on their own. And that the readings help them to be able to participate more confidently in their, in their class discussions about the subject matter and I think that's fantastic. I've heard from others that the readings have given them a new hobby. They were never really interested in literature before, but the readings somehow piqued their interest, and now they are regular listeners, and I'm so grateful for that. I've also heard from a family that told me that the readings have provided them with a means to uh, approach sensitive social matters as a family and to look at it through the eyes of other people. And I'm really, really grateful for that. So um, I hope that um, everyone will continue to listen and to benefit from what great literature has to teach all of us. And it can teach us so much. And it does so in such a wonderful way. And I just, I absolutely love it. So thank you so much for listening. And if you'd like to make a small contribution, please do so through the listener support tab. Or if you prefer to use the cash app method, you'll find that information in the episode description. In the event you have um, equipment that you'd like to donate, to improve the content quality. Starting next week, I will include a P.O. Box address in the episode description. And um, also, don't forget that you can interact through the Q&A section of each episode. So thank you again for listening. I really, really appreciate it every time you click on Carla Reads the Classics. And now let's get on with why you came here. So thank you for listening. Hi, everybody, and thanks for joining me here again at Carla Reads the Classics. I thought I would try something here that I've never done on this program, and that is attempt to read a play. This is Tennessee Williams' The Glass Menagerie, and this being the 77th anniversary of this great play's debut, I thought I would uh, do it the honor of presenting it here on my program. 
Uh, there are some challenges, however, because, you know, they have the production notes and the stage directions and so forth included in the play. And um, I won't read all of that. And hopefully we can still make some sense of the play without those things. Just a little bit of background to set it up. Uh, in the first scene, we're in the Wingfield apartment and the apartment is in the rear of a building and you enter the apartment through a fire escape. Now, closest to the audience is the living room, and the living room is also where Laura sleeps, and the sofa lets out to a bed for her. On the wall is a giant picture of their father in uniform, and also next to the picture of the father is the Greg shorthand diagram, and that'll make sense as the play goes on. But just to point those few things out to give the play a little bit of, of a setting before I jump into it. So let's give it a shot. Let's try to enjoy this play together. The Glass Menagerie by Tennessee Williams, copyright 1946. Yes, I have tricks in my pocket. I have things up my sleeve, but I am the opposite of a stage magician. He gives you illusion that has the appearance of truth. I give you truth and the pleasant disguise of illusion. To begin with, I turn back time. I reverse it to that quaint period, the 30s, when the huge middle class of America was matriculating in a school for the blind. Their eyes had failed them or had they failed their eyes, and so they were having their fingers pressed forcibly down on the fiery braille alphabet of a dissolving economy. In Spain, there was revolution. Here, there was only shouting and confusion. In Spain, there was Guernica. Here, there were disturbances of labor, sometimes pretty violent, and otherwise peaceful cities such as Chicago, Cleveland, St. Louis. This is the social background of the play. The play is memory. Being a memory play, it is dimly lighted. It is sentimental. It is not realistic. In memory, everything seems to happen to music. That explains the fiddle and the wings. I am the narrator of the play and also a character in it. The other characters are my mother, Amanda, my sister, Laura, and a gentleman caller who appears in the final scenes. He is the most realistic character in the play, being an emissary from a world of reality that we were somehow set apart from. But since I have a poet's weakness for symbols, I am using this character also as a symbol. He is the long delayed but always expected something that we live for. There is a fifth character in the play who doesn't appear except in this larger than life-size photograph over the mantle. This is our father who left us a long time ago. He was a telephone man who fell in love with long distances. He gave up his job with the telephone company and skipped the light fantastic out of town. The last we heard of him was a picture postcard from Mazatlan on the Pacific coast of Mexico containing a message of two words, hello, goodbye, and no address. I think the rest of the play will explain itself. Tom? Yes, mother. We can't say grace until you come to the table. Coming, mother. Honey, don't push with your fingers. If you have to push with something, the thing to push with is a crust of bread. And chew, chew. Animals have secretions in their stomachs, which enable them to digest food without mastication. But human beings are supposed to chew their food before they swallow it down. Eat food leisurely, son, and really enjoy it. A well-cooked meal has lots of delicate flavors that have to be held in the mouth for appreciation. So chew your food and give your salivary glands a chance to function. I haven't enjoyed one bite of this dinner because of your constant directions on how to eat it. It's you that make me rush through meals with your hawk-like attention to every bite I take. Sickening. Spoils my appetite. All this discussion of animals, secretion, salivary glands, mastication temperament like a metropolitan star. You're not excused from the table. I'm getting a cigarette. You smoke too much. I'll bring in the Mont Blanc. No, no, sister. You be the lady this time and I'll be the docky. I'm already up. 
resume your seat, little sister. I want you to stay fresh and pretty for gentlemen callers. I'm not expecting any gentlemen callers. Sometimes they come when they are least expected. Why, I remember one Sunday afternoon in Blue Mountain. I know what's coming. Yes, but let her tell it. Again, she loves to tell it. One Sunday afternoon in Blue Mountain, your mother received 17 gentlemen callers. Why, sometimes there weren't chairs enough to accommodate them all. We had to send the doggy over to bring in folding chairs from the parish house. How did you entertain those gentlemen callers? I understood the art of conversation. I bet you could talk. Girls in those days knew how to talk, I can tell you. Yes? They knew how to entertain their gentlemen callers. It wasn't enough for a girl to be possessed of a pretty face and graceful figure. Although I wasn't slighted in either respect, she also needed to have a nimble wit and a tongue to meet all occasions. What did you talk about? Things of importance going on in the world. Never anything coarse or common or vulgar. My callers were gentlemen all. Among my callers were some of the most prominent young planters of the Mississippi Delta. Planters and planters, planters and sons of planters. There was young champ Laughlin who later became vice president of the Delta Planters Bank. Hadley Stevenson, who was drowned in Moon Lake and left his widow $150,000 in government bonds. There were the Cotrera brothers, Wesley and Bates. Bates was one of my bright particular beaus. He got in a quarrel with that wild rain white boy. They shot it out on the floor of the Moon Lake Casino. Bates was shot through the stomach, died in the ambulance on his way to Memphis. His widow was so well provided for, came into eight or 10,000 acres, that's all. She married him on the rebound, never loved her, carried my picture on him the night he died. And there was that boy that every girl in the Delta had her cap for, had set her cap for, that beautiful, brilliant young Fitzhugh boy from Greene County. What did he live his, what did he leave his widow? He never married. Gracious, you talk as though all of my gentlemen callers had turned up their toes to the daisies. Isn't this the first you've mentioned that still survives? That Fitzhugh boy went north and made a fortune, came to be known as the wolf of as, as the wolf of Wall Street. He had the Midas touch, whatever he touched turned to gold. And I could have been Mrs. Duncan J. Fitzhugh, mind you, but I picked your father. Mother, let me clear the table. No, dear. You go in front and study your typewriter chart or practice your shorthand a little. Stay fresh and pretty. It's almost time for our gentlemen callers to start arriving. How many do you suppose we're going to entertain this afternoon? I don't believe we're going to receive any, Mother. What? No one? Not one? You must be joking. Not one gentleman caller. It can't be true. There must be a flood. There must have been a tornado. It isn't a flood. It's not a tornado, Mother. I'm I'm just not popular like you were in Blue Mountain. Mother's afraid I'm going to be an old maid. Scene two. Hello, Mother. I was... Deception, deception. How was the DAR meeting? Didn't you go to the DAR meeting, Mother? No, no. I did not have the strength to go to the DAR. In fact, I did not have the courage. I wanted to find a hole in the ground and hide myself in it forever. Why why did you do that, Mother? Why are you... Why? Why? How old are you, Laura? Mother, you know my age. I thought that you were an adult. It seems that I was mistaken. Please don't stare at me, Mother. What are we going to do? What is going to become of us? What what is the future? Has something happened, Mother? Mother, has something happened? I'll, I'll be all right in a minute. I'm just bewildered by life. Mother, I wish you would tell me what's happened. As you know, I was supposed to be inducted into my office at the DAR this afternoon. 
but I stopped off at, at Rubicam's Business College to speak to your teachers about your having a cold and ask them what progress they thought you were making down there. Oh, I went to the tapping instructor and introduced myself as your mother. She didn't know who you were. Wingfield, she said, we don't have any such student enrolled at the school. I assured her she did, that you had been going to classes since early in January. I wonder, she said, if you could be talking about that terribly shy little girl who dropped out of school after only two days attendance. No, I said, Laura, my daughter has been going to school every day for the past six weeks. Excuse me, she said. She, she took the attendance book out and there was your name unmistakably printed and all the dates that you were absent until they decided you had dropped out of school. I still said, no, no, there, there must have been some mistake. There must have been some mix up in the records. And she said, no, I remember her perfectly now. Her hand shook that she couldn't, she couldn't hit the keys right. The first time we gave a speed test, she broke down completely, was sick at the stomach and, and almost had to be carried into the washroom. After that morning, she never showed up anymore. We phoned the house but never got any answer. While I was working at Famous Bar, I suppose demonstrating those... Oh, I felt so weak I could barely keep on my feet. I had to sit down while they got me a glass of water. $50 tuition, all of our plans, my hopes and ambitions for you, just going up the spout, just going up the spout, just like that. What are you doing? Oh, Laura, where have you been going when, when you've been going out pretending that you were going to business college? I've just been going out walking. That's not true. It is. I just went walking. Walking? Walking? In winter? Deliberately caught in pneumonia in that light coat? Where did you walk to, Laura? All sorts of places, mostly in the park. Even after you started catching that cold? It was the lesser of two evils, Mother. I couldn't go back there. I, I threw up on the floor. From half past seven to five every day, you mean to tell me you walked around in the park because you wanted to make me think you were still going to Rubicam's business college? It wasn't as bad as it sounds. I went inside places to get warmed up. Inside where? I went in the art museum and the birdhouses at the zoo. I visited the penguins every day. Sometimes I did without lunch and went to the movies. Lately, I've been spending most of my afternoons in the jewel box, that big glass house where they raise tropical flowers. You did all this to deceive me? Just for deception? Why? Mother, when you're disappointed, you get that awful suffering look on your face like the picture of Jesus' mother in the museum. Hush! I couldn't face it! So what are we going to do the rest of our lives? Stay home and watch the parades go by? Amuse ourselves with a glass menagerie, darling? Eternally play those worn out phonograph records that your father left as a painful reminder of him? We won't have a business career. We've given that up because it gave us nervous indigestion. What is there left but dependency all our lives? I know so well what becomes of unmarried women who aren't prepared to occupy a position. I've seen such pitiful cases in the South. Barely tolerated spinsters living upon the grudge and patronage of sister's husband or brother's wife. Stuck away in some little mousetrap of a room. Encouraged by one in-law to visit another. Little bird-like women without any nest. Eating the crust of humility all their life. Is that the future that we've mapped out for ourselves? I swear it's the only alternative I can think of. It isn't a very pleasant alternative, is it? Of course, some girls do marry. Haven't you ever liked some boy? Yes, I liked one once. I came across his picture a while ago. He gave you his picture? No, it's, it's in the yearbook. Oh, a high school boy. Yes, his name was Jim. Here he is in the Pirates of Penzance. The what? 
the operetta the senior class put on. He had a wonderful voice, and we sat across the aisle from each other Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays in the odd. Here he is with the silver cup for debating. See his grin? He must have had a jolly disposition. He used to call me Blue Roses. Why did he call you a name such as that? When I had that attack of pleurosis, he asked me what was the matter when I came back. I said pleurosis. He thought I said blue roses. So that's what he always called me after that. Whenever he saw me, he'd holler, hello, blue roses. I didn't care for the girl that he went out with, Emily Meisenbach. Emily was the best dressed girl at Solden. She never struck me though as, as being sincere. It says in the personal section they're engaged. That's six years ago. They must be married by now. Girls that aren't cut out for business career careers usually wind up married to some nice man. Sister, that's what you'll do. But mother... Yes? I'm crippled. Nonsense, Laura. I've told you never, never to use that word. Why, you're not crippled. You just have a little defect, hardly noticeable even. When people have some slight disadvantage like that, they cultivate other things to make up for it, develop charm and vivacity and, and charm. That's all you have to do. One thing your father had plenty of was charm. Scene 3 after the fiasco at Rubicam's business college, the idea of getting a gentleman caller for Laura began to play a more and more important part in Mother's calculations. It became an obsession, like some archetype of the universal unconscious. The image of the gentleman caller haunted our small apartment. A young man at the door of a house with flowers. An evening at home rarely passed without some allusion to this image, this specter, this hope. Even when he wasn't mentioned, his presence hung in mother's preoccupied look and in my sister's frightened, apologetic manner, hung like a sentence passed upon the Wingfields. Mother was a woman of action as well as words. She began to take logical steps in the planned direction. Late that winter and in the early spring, realizing that extra money would be needed to properly feather the nest and plume the bird, she conducted a vigorous campaign on the telephone, roping in subscribers to one of those magazines for matrons called The Homemaker's Companion, the type of journal that features the serialized sublimations of ladies of letters who think in terms of delicate cupcake breasts, slim, tapering waists, rich, creamy thighs, eyes like wood smoke in autumn, fingers that soothe and caress like strains of music, bodies as powerful as Etruscan sculpture. Ida Scott, this is Amanda Wingfield. We missed you at the DAR last Monday. I said to myself, she, she's probably suffering with that sinus condition. How is that sinus condition? Horrors, heaven have mercy. You're a Christian martyr. Yes, that's what you are, a Christian martyr. Well, I just now happen to notice that your subscription to the Companion's about to expire. Yes, it, it expires with the next issue, honey. Just when that wonderful new serial by Bessie Mae Hopper is getting off to such an exciting start. Oh, honey, it's something that you can't miss. You remember how Gone with the Wind took everybody by storm? You simply couldn't go out if you hadn't read it. All everybody talked about was Scarlett O'Hara. Well, this is the book that critics already compared to Gone with the Wind. It's Gone with the Wind of a post-World War generation. What? burning. Oh, honey, don't let them burn. Go take a look in the oven and I'll hold the wire. Heavens, I think she's hung up. You think I'm in love with the Continental Shoemakers? What in Christ's name am I? Don't you use that. What am I supposed to do? Expression, not in my. Have you gone out of your senses? I have, that's true, driven out. What is the matter with you, you, you big idiot? Look, I've got no thing, no single thing. Lower your voice. And my life here that I can call my own, everything is, stop that shouting. 
Yesterday, you confiscated my books. You had the nerve to. I took that horrible novel back to the library. Yes, that hideous book by that insane Mr. Lawrence. I cannot control the output of diseased minds or people who cater to them, but I won't allow such filth brought into my home. No, 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 no. Who pays the rent on it? Who makes a slave of himself to? Don't you dare. No, no, I mustn't say things. I've just got to let me tell you. I don't want to hear anymore. You will hear more. No, I won't hear more. I'm going out. You come right back in. Out, 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 because I'm... Come back here, Tom Wingfield. I'm not through talking to you. Oh, go, Tom. You're going to listen and no more insolence from you. I'm at the end of my patience. What do you think I'm at? Aren't I supposed to have any patience to reach the end of, Mother? I know, I know. It seems unimportant to you what I'm doing, what I want to do, having a little difference between them. You don't think that. I think you've been doing things that you're ashamed of. That's why you act like this. I don't believe that you go every night to the movies. Nobody goes to the movies night after night. Nobody in their right minds goes to the movies as often as you pretend to. People don't go to the movies at nearly midnight, and movies don't let out at 2 a.m. Come in, stumbling, muttering to yourself like a maniac. You get three hours sleep and then go to work. Oh, I can picture the way you're doing down there, moping, doping, because you're in no condition. No, I'm in no condition. And what right have you got to jeopardize your job, jeopardize the security of us all? How do you think we'd manage if you were... Listen, you think I'm crazy about the warehouse? You think I'm in love with the Continental Shoemakers? You think I want to spend 55 years down there in that Celotex interior with fluorescent tubes? Look, I'd rather somebody picked up a crowbar and battered out my brains than go back mornings. I go. Every time you come in yelling that goddamn rise and shine, rise and shine, I say to myself how lucky dead people are. But I get up. I go. For $65 a month, I give up all that I dream of doing, of being ever. And you say, self, self's all I ever think of. Why, listen, if self is all I ever thought of, mother, I'd be where he is, gone. As far as the system of transportation reaches, don't grab at me, mother. Where are you going? I'm going to the movies. I don't believe that lie. I'm going to opium dens, yes. Yes, opium dens, dens of vice and criminals hangouts, mother. I joined the Hogan gang. I'm a hired assassin. I carry a Tommy gun and a violin, and a violin case. I run a string of cat houses in the alley. They call me Killer, Killer Wingfield. I'm leading a double life, a simple, honest warehouse worker by day. By night, a dynamic czar of the underworld, mother. I go to gambling casinos. I spin away fortunes on the roulette table. I wear a patch over one eye and a false mustache. Sometimes I put on green whiskers. On those occasions, they call me El Diablo. Oh, I could tell you many things to make you sleepless. My enemies plan to dynamite this place. They're going to blow us all sky high some night, and I'll be glad, very glad, and so will you. You go up, up, up on a broomstick over Blue Mountain with 17 gentlemen callers, you ugly, babbling old witch. My glass menagerie. I won't speak to you again until you apologize. Scene four. One crack and it falls through. Tom, Tom, what are you doing? Looking for the door key. Where have you been all this time? I've been to the movies. All this time at the movies? There was a very long program. There was a Garbo picture and a Mickey Mouse and a travel log and a newsreel and a preview of coming attractions. And there was an organ solo and a collection for the Milk Fund simultaneously, which ended up in a terrible fight between a fat lady and an usher. Did you have to stay through everything? Of course. And oh, I forgot. There was a big stage show. The headliner on the stage was Malvolio, the, the magician. He performed wonderful tricks, many of them such as pouring water back and forth between pictures. First it turned to wine, and then it turned to beer, and then it turned to whiskey. 
I know it was whiskey. It, it finally turned into because he needed somebody to come up out of the audience to help him. And, and I came up both shows. It was Kentucky Straight Bourbon, a very generous fellow. He gave souvenirs. He gave me this. This is a magic scarf. You can have it, Laura. You wave it over a canary cage and you get a bowl of goldfish. You wave it over the goldfish bowl and they fly away canaries. But the wonderfulest trick of all was the coffin trick. We nailed him into a coffin and he got out of the coffin without removing one nail. There is a trick that would come in handy for me. Get me out of this two by four situation. Tom, shh. What are you shushing me for? You wake up mother. Goody, goody, pay her back for all those rises and shines. You know, it, it, it don't take much intelligence to get yourself into a nailed up coffin, Laura, Laura, but who in the hell ever got himself out of one without removing one nail? Rise and shine. I'll rise, but I won't shine. Laura, tell your brother his coffee is ready. Tom, it's nearly seven. Don't make mother nervous. Tom, speak to mother this morning. Make up with her. Apologize. Speak to her. She won't to me. It's her that started not speaking. If you just say you're sorry, she'll start speaking. Her not speaking. Is that such a tragedy? Please, please. Laura, are you going to do what I ask you to do or do I have to get dressed and go out myself? Going, going, as soon as I get on my coat. Butter and what else? Just butter. Tell them to charge it. Mother, they make such faces when I do that. Sticks and stones can break our bones, but the expression on Mr. Garfinkel's face won't harm us. Tell your brother his coffee is getting cold. Do what I ask you, will you? Will you, Tom? Laura, go now or just don't go at all. Going, going. Laura, I'm, I'm all right. I slept, but I'm all right. If anyone breaks a leg on those fire escape steps, the landlord ought to be sued for every sin he possesses. Mother, I, I apologize, Mother. I'm sorry for what I said, for everything that I said. I, I didn't mean it. My devotion has made me a witch, and so I make myself hateful to my children. No, no, you don't. I worry so much, don't sleep, it makes me nervous. I understand that. I've had to put up a solitary battle all these years, but you're my right hand bower. Don't fall down, don't fail me. I try, mother. Try and you will succeed. Why, you, you're just full of natural endowments. Both of my children, they're unusual children. Don't you think I know it? I'm so proud, happy, and I, I, I feel I have so much to be thankful for. But promise me one thing, son. What, mother? Promise, son, you'll never be a drunkard. I will never be a drunkard, mother. That's what frightened me so, that, that you'd been drinking. Eat a bowl of Purina just coffee mother shredded wheat biscuit no no mother just coffee you can't put in a day's work on an empty stomach you've got 10 minutes don't gulp drinking two hot liquids makes cancer of the stomach put cream in no thank you to cool it no no thank you i want it black i know but it's not good for you we have to do all that we can to build ourselves up in these trying times we live in all that we have to cling to is each other that's why it's so important to Tom I I sent your sister so I could discuss something with you if you hadn't spoken I would have spoken to you what is it mother that, that you want to discuss Laura oh Laura you know how Laura is so quiet but still water runs deep she notices things and I think she she broods about them a few days ago I came in and she was crying what about you? Me? She has an idea that you're not happy here. What gave her that idea? What gives her any idea? 
However, you do act strangely. I, I'm not criticizing, understand that. I know your ambitions do not lie in the warehouse, that like everybody in the whole wide world, you've had to, to make sacrifices. But Tom, Tom, life's not easy. It calls for Spartan endurance. There's so many things in my heart that I cannot describe to you. I never told you this, but I, I loved your father. I know that, mother. And you, when I see you taken after his ways, staying out late, and, and well, you, you had been drinking that night. You, you were in that terrifying condition. Laura says that you hate the apartment and that you go out nights to get away from it. Is that true, Tom? No. You say there's so much in your heart that you can't describe to me. That's true of me, too. There's so much in my heart that I can't describe to you. So let's just respect each other. But why? Why, Tom? Are you always so restless? Where do you go to nights? I go to the movies. Why do you go to the movies so much, Tom? I go to the movies because I like adventure. Adventure is something that I don't have much of at work, so I go to the movies. But Tom, you go to the movies entirely too much. I like a lot of adventure. Most young men find adventure in their careers. Then most young men are not employed in a warehouse. The world is full of young men employed in warehouses and offices and factories. Do all of them find adventure in their careers? They do or they do without it. Not everybody has a craze for adventure. Man is by instinct a lover, a hunter, a fighter, and none of those instincts are given much play at the warehouse. Man is by instinct. Don't quote instinct to me. Instinct is something that people have got away from. It belongs to animals. Christian adults don't want it. What do Christian adults want then, mother? Superior things, things of the mind and of the spirit. Only animals have to satisfy instincts. Surely your aims are somewhat higher than theirs, than monkeys, pigs. I reckon they're not. You're joking. However, that, that isn't what I wanted to discuss. I haven't much time. Sit down. You want me to punch in red at the warehouse, mother? You have five minutes. I want to talk to you about Laura. All right. What about Laura? We, we have to be making some plans and provisions for her. She's older than you, two years, and nothing has happened. She just drifts along doing nothing. It frightens me terribly how she just drifts along. I guess she's the type that people call home girls. There's no such type, and if there is, it's a pity. That is, unless the home is hers, with a husband. What? Oh, I can see the handwriting on the wall as plain as I can see the nose in front of my face. It's terrifying. More and more, you remind me of your father. He was out all hours without explanation, then left. Goodbye. And me with a bag to hold. And I saw that letter you got from the merchant marine. I know what you're dreaming of. I'm not standing here blindfolded. Very well, then. Then do it, but not till there's somebody to take your place. What do you mean? I mean that as soon as Laura has got somebody to take care of her, married, a home of her own, independent, why, then you'll be free to go wherever you please, on land, on sea, whichever way the wind blows you. But until that time, you've got to look out for your sister. I don't say me because I'm old and don't matter. I say for your sister because she's young and dependent. I put her in that business college, a dismal failure. Frightened her so it made her sick at the stomach. I took her over to the Young People's League at the church. Another fiasco. She spoke to nobody. Nobody spoke to her. Now all she does is fool with those pieces of glass and play those worn out records. What kind of life is that for a girl to lead? What can I do about it? Overcome selfishness? Self, self, self is all you ever think of. Where is your muffler? Put on your wool muffler. I haven't said what I have in mind to ask you. I'm too late to... Down at the warehouse, aren't there some nice young men? No, there must be some. Find, find out one that's clean living, doesn't drink, and ask him out for sister. What? For sister to me, get acquainted. Oh, my gosh. Will you? Will you? Will you, dear? Yes. Ella Cartwright? 
This is Amanda Wingfield. How are you, honey? How is that kidney infection? Horrors. You're a Christian martyr. Yes, honey, that's what you are, a Christian martyr. Well, I just now happen to notice in my little red book that your subscription to The Companion has just run out. I know that you wouldn't want to miss out on the wonderful series starting in this new issue. It's by Bessie Mae Harper, the first one she's written since Honeymoon for Three. Wasn't that a strange and interesting story? Well, this one is even lovelier, I believe. It has a sophisticated society background. It's all about the horses set on Long Island. Son, will you do me a favor? What? Comb your hair? You look so pretty when your hair is combed. There is only one respect in which I would like you to emulate your father. What respect is that? The care he took of his appearance. He never allowed himself to look untidy. Where are you going? I'm going out to smoke. You smoke too much. A pack a day at 15 cents a pack. How much would that amount to in a month? 30 times 15 is how much, Tom? Figure it out and you will be astounded at what you could save. Enough to give you a night school course in accounting at Washington U. Just think what a wonderful thing that would be for you, son. I'd rather smoke. That's the tragedy of it. Across the alley from us was the Paradise Dance Hall. On evenings in the spring, the windows and doors were open and the music came outdoors. Sometimes the lights were turned out except for a large glass sphere that hung from the ceiling. It would turn slowly about and filter the dusk with delicate rainbow colors. Then the orchestra played a waltz or a tango, something that had a slow and sensuous rhythm. Couples would come outside outside to the relative privacy of the alley. You could see them kissing behind ash pits and telephone poles. This was the compensation for lives that paused, that passed like mine, without any change or adventure. Adventure and change were imminent in, in this year. They were waiting around the corner for all these kids, suspended in the midst over Birch's garden, caught in the folds of Chamberlain's umbrella. In Spain, there was Guernica, but here there was only hot swing music and liquor, dance halls, bars, and movies, and sex that hung in the gloom like a chandelier and flooded the world with brief, deceptive rainbows. rainbows. All the world was waiting for, for bombardments. A fire escape landing's a poor excuse for a porch. What are you looking at? The moon. Is there a moon this evening? It's rising over Garfinkel's delicatessen. So it is. A little silver slipper of a moon. Have you made a wish on it yet? Mm-hmm. What did you wish for? That's a secret. A secret, huh? Well, I won't tell mine either. I will be just as mysterious as you. I bet I can guess what yours is. Is my head so transparent? You're not a sphinx. No, I don't have secrets. I'll tell you what I wish for on the moon. Success and happiness for my precious children. I wish for that whenever there's a moon, and when there isn't a moon, I wish for it too. I thought perhaps you wished for a gentleman caller. Why do you say that? Don't you remember asking me to fetch one? I remember suggesting that it would be nice for your sister if you brought home some nice young man from the warehouse. I think that I've made that suggestion more than once. Yes, you have made it repeatedly. Well, we are going to have one. What? A gentleman caller. A caller with a bouquet. You mean you have asked some nice young man to come over? Yep, I invited him to dinner. You really did? I did. You did, and, and he, did he accept? He did. Well, 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 that's lovely. I thought you would be pleased. It's definite then? Very definite. Soon? Very soon. For heaven's sake, stop putting on and tell me some things, will you? What things do you want me to tell you? Well, naturally, I would like to know when he's coming. He's coming tomorrow. Tomorrow? Tomorrow. But Tom! Yes, mother? Tomorrow gives me no time. Time for what? Preparations. Why didn't you phone me at once as soon as you asked him, the minute that he accepted? Then don't you see I could have been getting ready? You don't have to make any fuss. Oh, Tom, 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 of course I have to make a fuss. I want things nice, not sloppy, not thrown together. I'll certainly have to do some fast thinking, won't I? 
I don't see why you have to think at all. You just don't know. We can't have a gentleman caller in a pigsty. All my wedding silver has to be polished. The monogram table linen ought to be laundered. The windows have to be washed and fresh curtains put up. And, and how about clothes? We have to wear something, don't we? Mother, this boy is no one to make a fuss over. Do you realize he's the first man we've introduced to your sister? It's terrible, dreadful, disgraceful that poor little sister has never received a single gentleman caller. Tom, come inside. What for? I, I want to ask you some things. If you're going to make such a fuss, I'll call it off. I'll tell him not to come. You certainly won't do anything of the kind. Nothing offends people worse than broken engagements. It, it simply means I'll have to work like a Turk. We won't be brilliant, but we will pass inspection. Come on inside. Sit down. Any particular place you would like me to sit? Thank heavens I got that new sofa. I'm also making payments on a floor lamp I'll have sent out. And put the chintz covers on. They'll brighten things up. Of course I'd hope to have these walls repapered. What, what is the young man's name? His name is O'Connor. That, of course, means fish. Tomorrow is Friday. I'll have that salmon loaf with Durkee's dressing. What does he do? He, he works at the warehouse? Of course. How else would I? Tom, th does he drink? Why do you ask me that? Your father did. Don't get started on that. He does drink then. Not that I know of. Make sure, be certain. The last thing I want for my daughter is a boy who drinks. Aren't you being a little bit premature? Mr. Mr. O'Connor has not yet appeared on the scene. But will tomorrow to meet your sister? What do I know about his character? Nothing. Old maids are better off than wives of drunkards. Oh, my God. Be still. Lots of fellows meet girls whom they don't marry. Oh, talk sensibly, Tom, and don't be sarcastic. What are you doing? I'm brushing down that cowlick. What is the young man's position at the warehouse? The young man's position is that of a shipping clerk, mother. Sounds to me like a fairly responsible job, the sort of job you would be in if you just had more get up. What is his salary? You have any idea? I would judge it to be approximately $85 a month. Well, not princely, but 20 more than I make. Yes, how well I know. But for a family man, $85 a month is not much more than you can just get by on. Yes, but Mr. O'Connor is not a family man. He might be, mightn't he, sometime in the future. I see plans and provisions. You are the only man that I know of who ignores the fact that the future becomes the present, the present, the past, and the past turns into everlasting regret if you don't plan for it. I will think that over and see what I can make of it. Don't be supercilious with your mother. Tell me some more about this, what, what, what do you call him? James D. O'Connor. The D is for Delaney. Oh, Irish on both sides. Gracious, and doesn't drink? Shall I call him up and ask him right this minute? The only way to find out about those things is to make discreet inquiries at the proper moment. When I was a girl in Blue Mountain and it was suspected that a young man drank, the girl whose attentions he had been receiving, if any girl was, would sometimes speak to the minister of his church, or rather her father would if her father was living, and sort of feel him out on the young man's character. That is the way such things are discreetly handled to keep a young woman from making a tragic mistake. Then how did you happen to make a tragic mistake? That innocent look of your father's had everyone fooled. He smiled. The world was enchanted. No girl can do worse than put herself at the mercy of a handsome appearance. I hope that Mr. O'Connor is not too good looking. No, he's not too good looking. He's covered with freckles and hasn't too much of a nose. He's not downright homely, though. No, not downright homely. Just medium homely, I'd say. Character's what to look for in a man. That's what I've always said, mother. You've never said anything of the kind, and I suspect you would never give it a thought. Don't be so suspicious of me. At least I hope he's the type that's up and coming. I think he really goes in for self-improvement. What reason have you to think so? He goes to night school. Splendid. What does he do? I mean, study. Radio engineering and public speaking. Then he has visions of being advanced in the world. Any young man who studies public speaking is aiming to have an executive job someday. And radio engineering, a thing for the future. 
Both of these facts are very illuminating. These are the sorts of things that a mother should know concerning any young man who comes to call on her daughter, seriously or not. One little warning, he doesn't know about Laura. I didn't let on that we had dark ulterior motives. I just said, why don't you come and have dinner with us? He said, okay, and that was the whole conversation. I bet it was. You're as eloquent, eloquent as an oyster. However, he will know about Laura when he gets here. When he sees how lovely and sweet and pretty she is, he'll think and he'll he'll thank his lucky stars he was asked to dinner. Mother, you mustn't expect too much of Laura. What do you mean? Laura seems all those things to you and me because she's ours and we love her. We don't even notice she's crippled anymore. Don't say crippled. You know I don't allow that word to be used. But face facts, mother, she is, and that's not all. What do you mean, not all? Laura is very different from other girls. I think the difference is all to her advantage. Not quite all. In the eyes of others, strangers, she's terribly shy and lives in a world of her own, and those things make her seem a little peculiar to people outside the house. Don't say peculiar. Face the facts, she is. In what way is she peculiar, may I ask? She lives in a world of her own, a world of little glass ornaments, mother. She plays old phonograph records, and that's about all. Where are you going? I'm going to the movies. No, not to the movies. Every night to the movies? I don't believe you always go to the movies. Laura? Laura? Yes, mother? Let those dishes go and come in front. Laura, come here and make a wish on the moon. Moon? Moon? A little silver slipper of a moon. Look over your left shoulder, Laura, and make a wish. Now, now, darling, wish. What shall I wish for, mother? Happiness, good fortune. Scene six. And so the following evening, I brought Jim home to dinner. I had known Jim slightly in high school. In high school, Jim was a hero. He had tremendous Irish good nature and vitality with the scrubbed and polished look of white chinaware. He seemed to move in a continual spotlight. He was the star in basketball, captain of the debating club, president of the senior class in the glee club, and he sang the male lead in the annual light operas. He was always running or bounding, just never, never just walking. He seemed always at the point of defeating the law of gravity. He was shooting with such velocity through his adolescence that you would logically expect him to arrive at nothing short of the White House by the time he was 30. But Jim apparently ran into more interference after his graduation from Solden. His speed had definitely slowed. Six years after he left high school, he was holding a job that wasn't much better than mine. He was the only one at the warehouse with whom I was on friendly terms. I was valuable to him as someone who could remember his former glory, who had seen him win basketball games and the silver cup in debating. He knew of my secret practice of retiring to the cabinet of the washroom to work on poems when business was slack in the warehouse. He called me Shakespeare. And while the other boys in the warehouse regarded me with suspicious hostility, Jim took a humorous attitude toward me. Gradually, his attitude affected the others. Their hostility wore off, and they also began to smile at me as people smile at an oddly fashioned dog who trots across their path at some distance. I knew that Jim and Laura had known each other at Solden, and I had heard Laura speak admiringly of his voice. I didn't know if Jim remembered her or not. In high school, Laura had been as unobtrusive as Jim had been astonishing. If he did remember Laura, it was not as my sister, for when I asked him to dinner, he grinned and said, You know, Shakespeare, I never thought of you as having folks. He was about to discover that I did. Why are you trembling? Mother, you've made me so nervous. How have I made you nervous? By all this fuss, you make it seem so important. I don't understand you, Laura. You couldn't be satisfied with just sitting home, and yet, and, and yet whenever I try to arrange something for you, you seem to resist it. 
Now, take a look at yourself. No, wait, just wait just a minute. I have an idea. What is it now? Mother, what, what are you doing? They call them gay deceivers. I won't wear them. You will. Why should I? Because to be painfully honest, your chest is flat. You make it seem like we're setting a trap. All pretty girls are a trap, a pretty trap, and men expect them to be. Now, look at yourself, young lady. This is the prettiest you will ever be. I've got to fix myself now. You're going to be surprised by your mother's appearance. It isn't dark enough yet. I'm going to show you something. I'm going to make a spectacular appearance. What is it, mother? Possess your soul and patience, you will see. Something I've resurrected from that old trunk. Styles haven't changed so terribly much after all. Now, just look at your mother. This is the dress in which I led the cotillion. Won the cakewalk twice at Sunset Hill. Wore one spring to the governor's ball in Jackson. See how I sashayed across the ballroom, Laura? I wore it on Sundays for my gentleman callers. I had it on the day I met your father. I had malaria fever all that spring. The change of climate from East Tennessee to the Delta weakened resistance. I had a little temperature all the time, not enough to be serious, just enough to make me restless and giddy. Invitations poured in, parties all over the Delta. Stay in bed, said mother, you have a fever. But I just couldn't. I took quinine, but kept on going, going. Evening dances, afternoons, long, long rides, picnics. Lovely, so lovely that, so lovely that country in May. All lacy with dogwood, literally flooded with jonquils. That was the spring I had the craze for jonquils. Jonquils became an absolute obsession. Mother said, honey, there's no, no more room for jonquils. And still, I kept bringing in more jonquils. Whenever, wherever I saw them, I'd say, stop, stop, I see jonquils. I made the young man help me gather the jonquils. It was a joke, Amanda and her jonquils. Finally, there were no more vases to hold them. Every available space was filled with jonquils. No vases to hold them? All right, I hold them myself. And then I met your father. Malaria fever and jonquils, and then this boy. I hope they get here before it starts to rain. I gave your brother a little extra chain so he and Mr. O'Connor could take the service car home. What did you say his name was? O'Connor. What is his first name? I don't remember. Oh, oh yes, I do. It was Jim. Not Jim. Yes, that's what it was. That's it. It was Jim. I've never known a Jim that wasn't nice. Are you sure his name is Jim O'Connor? Yes. Why? Is he the one that Tom used to know in high school? He didn't say so. I think he just got to know him at the warehouse. There was a Jim O'Connor we both knew in high school. If that's the one that Tom is bringing home to dinner, you have to excuse me. I won't come to the table. What sort of nonsense is this? You asked me once if I'd ever liked a boy. Don't you remember? I showed you, I showed you the boy's picture. You mean the boy you showed me in the yearbook? Yes, that boy. Laura, Laura, you were in love with that boy? I don't know, Mother. All I know is I couldn't sit at the table if it was him. It won't be him. It isn't the least bit likely. But whether it is or not, you will come to the table. You will not be excused. I'll have to be, Mother. I don't intend to humor your silliness, Laura. I've had too much from you and your brother, both. So just sit down and compose yourself till they come. Tom has forgotten his key, so you'll have to let them in when they arrive. Oh, Mother, you answer the door. I'll be in the kitchen, busy. Oh, Mother, please answer the door. Don't make me do it. I've got to fix the dressing for the salmon. Fuss, fuss, silliness over a gentleman caller. Laura, sweetheart, the door. I think we just beat the rain. Uh-huh. Laura, that is your brother and Mr. O'Connor. Will you let them in, darling? Mother, you go to the door. Please, please. What is the matter with you, you silly thing? Please, you answer it, please. I told you I wasn't going to humor you, Laura. Why have you chosen this moment to lose your mind? 
please, please, you go. I'll have to go to the door because you'll have to go to the door because I can't. I can't either. Why? I'm sick. I'm sick too of your nonsense. Why can't you and your brother be normal people? Fantastic whims and behavior. Pros prosperous goings on. Can you give me one reason? Why, could you, why should you just be afraid to open a door? Now you answer it, Laura. Oh, oh. Laura Wingfield, you march right to that door. Yes, yes, mother. Laura, this is Jim. Jim, this is my sister, Laura. I didn't know that Shakespeare had a sister. How, how do you do? Okay. Your hand's cold, Laura. Yes, well, I, I've been playing the Victrola. You must have been playing classical music on it. You ought to play a little hot swing music to warm you up. Excuse me, I haven't finished playing the Victrola. What was the matter? Oh, with Laura. Laura is terribly shy. Terribly shy. Shy, huh? It's unusual to meet a girl shy nowadays. I don't believe you ever mentioned you had a sister. Well, you know now, I have one. Here's that post-dispatch. You want a piece of it? Uh-huh. What piece? The comics? Sports. Old Dizzy Dean is on his bad behavior. Yeah? Where are you going? I'm going out on the terrace. You know, Shakespeare, I'm going to sell you a bill of goods. What goods? Of course I'm taking. Huh? In public speaking, you and me, we're not the warehouse type. Thanks, that's the good news. But what has public speaking got to do with it? It fits you for executive positions. Oh, I, I tell you, it's done a hell of a lot of good for me. In what respect? In every. Ask yourself, what is the difference between you and me and men in the office down front? Brains? No. Ability? No. Then what? Just one little thing. What is that one little thing? Primarily, it amounts to social poise, being able to square up to people and hold your own on any social level. Tom? Yes, mother. Is that you and Mr. O'Connor? Yes, mother. Well, you just make yourselves comfortable in there. Yes, mother. Ask Mr. O'Connor if he would like to wash his hands. Oh, no, no, thank you. I took care of that at the warehouse. Tom. Yes. Mr. Mendoza was speaking to me about you. Favorably. What do you think? Well, you're going to be out of a job if you don't wake up. I am waking up. You show no signs. The signs are interior. The sailing vessel with the Jolly Roger again. I'm planning to change. What are you, what are you gassing about? I'm tired of the movies. Movies? Yes, movies. Look at them. All of those glamorous people having adventures, hogging it all, gobbling the whole thing up. You know what happens? People go to the movies instead of moving. Hollywood characters are supposed to have all the adventures for everybody in America while everybody in America sits in a dark room and watches them have them. Yes, until there's a war. That's when adventure becomes available to the masses. Everyone's dish, not only Gables. Then the people in the dark room come out of the dark room to have some adventures themselves. Goody, goody. It's our turn now. Go to the South Sea Island to make a safari, to be exotic, far off. But I'm not patient. I don't want to wait till then. I'm tired of the movies and I'm about to move. Move? Yes. When? Soon. Where? Where? I'm starting to boil inside. I know I seem dreamy, but inside, well, I'm boiling. Whenever I pick up a shoe, I shudder a little thinking how short life is and what I'm doing. Whatever that means, what, whatever that means, I don't know what shoes has to do except something to wear on a traveler's foot. What? I'm a member, the union of the merchant seamen. If you didn't realize it, this is a totally free podcast. How does Carla do it? Well, she loves to read the classics, but we all could use a little help now and then. So if you'd like to show your appreciation, any small donation would be appreciated. Visit anchor.fm slash Carla 3507 or cash app dollar sign Jess TSM. 
I paid my dues this month instead of the light bill. You will regret it when they turn the lights off. I won't be here. How about your mother? I'm like my father, the bastard son of a bastard. Did you notice how he's grinning in the picture there? And he's been absent going on 16 years. You're just talking, you drip. How does your mother feel about it? Shh, here comes mother. Mother is not acquainted with my plans. Where are you all? On the terrace, mother. Well, 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 so this is Mr. O'Connor. Introductions entirely unnecessary. I've heard so much about you from my boy. I finally said to him, Tom, good gracious, why don't you bring this paragon to supper? I'd like to meet this nice young man at the warehouse. Instead of just hearing him sing your praises so much, I don't know why my son is so standoffish. That's not Southern behavior. Let's sit down and I think we could stand a little more air in here. Tom, leave the door open. I felt a nice breeze a moment ago. Where has it gone to? Mmm, so warm already and not quite summer even. We're going to burn up when summer finally gets here. However, we're having, we're having a very light supper. I think light things are better for this time of the year. The, the, the same as light clothes are. Light clothes and light food are what warm weather calls for. You know, our blood gets so thick during the winter, it takes a while for us to adjust ourselves. When the season changes, it, it comes so quick this year. I wasn't prepared. All of a sudden, heaven's already summer. I ran to the trunk and pulled out this light dress, terribly old, historical almost, but feels so good, so good and cool, you know. Mother. Yes, honey. How about supper? Honey, you go and ask sister if supper is ready. You know the sister is in full charge of supper. Tell her you hungry boys are waiting for it. Have you met Laura? She let you in? Oh, good. You've met already. It's, it, it's rare for a girl as sweet and pretty as Laura to be domestic. But Laura is, thank heavens, not only pretty, but also very domestic. I'm not at all. I never was a bit. I never could make a thing but angel food cake. Well, in the South, we had so many servants. Gone, gone, gone. All vestige of gracious living. Gone completely. I wasn't prepared for what the future brought me. All of my gentlemen callers were sons of planters, and so, of course, I assumed that I would be married to one and raise my family on a large piece of land with plenty of servants. But man proposes, and woman accepts the proposal. To vary that old, old saying a little bit, I married no planter. I married a man who worked for the telephone company, that gallantly smiling gentleman over there a telephone man who fell in love with long distance. Now he travels and I don't even know where. But what am I going on for about my tribulations? Tell me yours. I hope you don't have any. Tom? Yes, mother. Is supper nearly ready? It looks to me like supper is on the table. Let me look. Oh, lovely, but where is sister? Laura is not feeling well and she says that she thinks she'd better not come to the table. What? Nonsense, Laura. Oh, Laura. Yes, mother. You really must come to the table. We won't be seated until you come to the table. Come in, Mr. O'Connor. You sit right over there and out. Laura, Laura Wingfield, you're keeping us waiting, honey. We can't say grace until you come to the table. Laura, Laura. Why, Laura, you are ill, darling. Tom, help your sister into the living room, dear. Sit in the living room, Laura. Rest on the sofa. Well, standing over the hot stove made her ill. I told her that it was just too warm this evening, but is Laura all right now? Yes. What is that? Rain? A nice cool rain has come up. I think we may have grace now. Tom, honey, you say grace. Oh, for all these and thy mercies... God's holy name be praised. Scene seven. Hey there, Mr. Lightbulb. Where was Moses when the lights went out? <laughs> Do you know the answer to that one, Mr. O'Connor? No, ma'am. What's the answer? In the dark? Everybody sit still. I'll light the candles. Isn't it lucky we have them on the table? Where's a match? Which of you gentlemen can provide a match? 
Here, thank you, sir. Not at all, ma'am. I guess the fuse is burnt out. Mr. O'Connor, can you tell a burnt out fuse? I know I can't, and Tom is a total loss when it comes to mechanics. Oh, careful you don't bump into something. We don't want our gentleman caller to break his neck. Now, wouldn't that be a fine howdy-do? <laughs> Where's the fuse box? Right here next to the stove. Can you see anything? Just a minute. It's electric isn't electricity a mysterious thing? Wasn't it Benjamin Franklin who, who tied a key to a kite? We live in such a mysterious universe, don't we? Some people say that science clears up all the mysteries for us. In my opinion, it only creates more. Have you found it yet? No, ma'am. All these fuses look okay to me. Tom? Yes, mother. That light bill I gave you several days ago, the one I told you we got the notices about? Oh, yeah. You didn't neglect to pay it by any chance. Why, I didn't. I might have known. Shakespeare probably wrote a poem on that light bill, Mrs. Wingfield. I might have known better than to trust him with it. There is such a high price for negligence in this world. Maybe the poem will win a $10 prize. We'll just have to spend the remainder of the evening in the 19th century before Mr. Edison made the Mazda lamp. Candlelight is my favorite kind of light. That shows you're romantic, but that's no excuse for Tom. We'll, we'll, well, we, we got through dinner. Very considerate of them to let us get through dinner before they plunged us into everlasting darkness, wasn't it, Mr. O'Connor? <laughs> Tom, as a penalty for your carelessness, you can help me with the dishes. Let me give you a hand. Indeed, you will not. I ought to be good for something. Good for something? You? Why, Mr. O'Connor, nobody, nobody's given me this, this much entertainment in years as you have. Oh, now, Mrs. Wingfield. I'm not exaggerating, not one bit. But sister is all by her lonesome. You go keep her company in the parlor. I'll give you this lovely old candelabrum that used to be on the altar of the Church of the Heavenly Rest. It was belted a little out of shape when the church burnt down. Lightning struck it one spring. Gypsy Jones was holding a revival at the time, and he intimated that the church was destroyed because the Episcopalians gave card parties. <laughs> and how about you coaxing sister to drink a little wine? I think it would be good for her. Can you carry both at once? Sure, I'm Superman. Now, Thomas, get into that apron. I don't suppose you remember me at all. Hello there, Laura. Hello. How are you feeling? Better? Yes, yes, thank you. This is for you, a little dandelion wine. Thank you. Drink it, but don't get drunk. Where shall I set the candles? Oh, oh, anywhere. How about here on the floor? Any objections? No. I'll spread a newspaper under to catch the drippings. I'd like to sit on the floor. Mind if I do? Oh, no. Give me a pillow? What? A pillow. Oh, how about you? Don't you like to sit on the floor? Oh, yes. Why don't you then? I will. Take a pillow. I can hardly see you sitting way over there. I can see you. I know, but that's not fair. I'm in the limelight. Good. Now I can see you. Comfortable? Yes, so am I. Comfortable as a cow. Will you have some gum? No, thank you. I, I think I will indulge with your permission. Think of the fortunate, think of the fortune made by the guy that invented the first piece of chewing gum. Amazing, huh? The Wrigley Building is one of the sites of Chicago. I saw it when I went up to the Century of Progress. Did you take in the Century of Progress? No, I didn't. Well, it was quite a wonderful exposition. What impressed me most was the Hall of Science. Gives you an idea of what the future will be in America, even more wonderful than, than the present is. Your brother tells me you're shy. Is that right, Laura? I, I don't know. I judge you to be an old-fashioned type of girl. Well, I think that's a pretty good type to be. Hope you don't think I'm being too personal, do you? I believe I will take a piece of gum if you don't mind. Mr. O'Connor, ha have you kept up with your singing? Singing? Me? Yes, I remember what a beautiful voice you had. 
when did you hear me sing? You say you've heard me sing? Oh, yes, yes, very often. I don't suppose you remember me at all. You know, I have an idea I've seen you before. I had that idea as soon as you opened the door. It seemed almost like I was about to remember your name, but the name that I started to call you wasn't a name, and so I stopped myself before I said it. Was it Blue Roses? Blue roses, my goodness, yes, blue roses. That's what I had on my tongue when you opened the door. Isn't it funny what tricks your memory plays? I didn't connect you with high school somehow or other, but that's where it was. It was high school. I didn't even know you were Shakespeare's sister. Gosh, I'm sorry. I didn't expect you to. You barely knew me. But we did have a speaking acquaintance, huh? Yes, we spoke to each other. When did you recognize me? Oh, right away. Soon as I came in the door? When I heard your name, I thought it was probably you. I knew that Tom used to know you a little in high school, so when you came in the door, well, then I was sure. Why didn't you say something then? I, I didn't know what to say. I was too surprised. For goodness sake, you know, this sure is funny. Yes, yes it is, though. Didn't we have a class and something together? Yes, we did. What class was that? It was singing, chorus. Ah, oh, I sat across the aisle from you in the odd. Oh, Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays. Now I remember you always came in late. Yes, it was so hard for me getting upstairs. I had that brace on my leg. It clumped so loud. I never heard any clumping. To me, it sounded like thunder. Well, 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 I never even noticed. And everybody was seated before I came in. I had to walk in front of all those people. My seat was in the back row. I had to go clumping all the way up the aisle with everyone watching. You shouldn't have been self-conscious. I know, but I was. It was always such a relief when the singing started. Ah, oh, yes, I placed you now. I used to call you Blue Roses. How was it that I got started calling you that? I was out of school a little while with pleurosis. When I came back, you asked me what was the matter. I said I had pleurosis. You thought I said blue roses. That's what you always called me after that. I hope you didn't mind. Oh, no, I liked it. You see, I wasn't acquainted with many people. As I remember, you sort of stuck by yourself. I, I never had much luck at, at making friends. I don't see why you wouldn't. Well, I just started out badly. You mean being, yes, it sort of stood between me. You shouldn't have let it. I know, but it did, and you were shy with people. I tried not to be, but never could. Overcome it? No, I never could. I guess being shy is something you have to work out of kind of gradually. Yes, I guess it takes time. Yes, people are not so dreadful when you know them. That's what you have to remember. And anybody has problems, not just you, but practically everybody has got some problems. You think of yourself as having the only problems, as being the only one who is disappointed. But just look around you and you will see lots of people as disappointed as you are. For instance, I hoped when I was going to high school that I would be further along at this time, six years later, than I am now. You remember that wonderful write-up I had in the torch? Yes! It said I was bound to succeed in anything I went into. Holy jeez, the torch! Here you are in the Pirates of Penzance. I sang the baritone lead in that opera. So beautifully. Aww. Yes, yes, beautifully, beautifully. You heard me? All three times? No. Yes, all three performances? Yes. Why? I, I wanted to ask you to autograph my program. Why didn't you ask me to? You were always surrounded by your own friends so much that I never had a chance to. You should have just... Well, I thought you might think I was thought I might think you was what? Oh, I was beleaguered by females in those days. You were terribly popular. Yeah, you had such a friendly way. I was spoiled in high school. Everybody liked you. 
including you? I, yes, I did too. Well, well, well. Give me that program, Laura. There you are. Better late than never. Oh, I, what a surprise. My signature isn't worth very much right now. But someday, maybe, it will increase in value. Being disappointed is one thing, and being discouraged is something else. I am disappointed, but I'm not discouraged. I'm, I'm 23 years old. How, how old are you? I'll be 24 in June. That's not old age. No, but you finished high school? I didn't go back. You mean you dropped out? I made bad grades in my final examinations. How is Emily Meisenbach getting along? Oh, that crowd head. Why do you call her that? That's what she was. You're not still going with her? I never see her. It said in the personal section that you were engaged. I know, but I wasn't impressed by that propaganda. It wasn't the truth? Only in Emily's optimistic opinion? Oh, what have you done since high school? What have you done since high school? Huh? I said, what have you done since high school, Laura? Nothing much. You must have been doing something these six long years. Yes. Well, then such as what? I took a business course at business college. How did that work out? Well, not very well. I had to drop out. It gave me indigestion. (laughs) What are you doing now? I don't do anything much. Oh, please don't think I I sit around doing nothing. My glass collection takes up a good deal of my time. Glass is something you have to take really good care of. What did you say about glass? Collection, I said. I, I have one. You know what I judge to be the trouble with you? Inferiority complex. You know what that is? That's what they call it when someone low rates himself. I understand it because I had it too, although my case was not so aggravated as yours seemed to be. I had it until I took up public speaking, developed my voice, and learned that I had an aptitude for science. Before that time, I never thought of myself as being outstanding in any way whatsoever. Now, I've never made a regular study of it, but I have a friend who says I can analyze people better than doctors that make a profession of it. I I don't claim to be that I don't claim that to be necessarily true, but I can sure guess a person's psychology, Laura. Excuse me, Laura. I always take it out when the flavor is gone. I'll, I'll use this scrap of paper to wrap it in. I know how it is to get stuck on a shoe. Yep, that's what I judge your principal to be your principal trouble, a lack of confidence in yourself as a person. You don't have the proper amount of faith in yourself. I'm basing that on the fact of a number of your remarks and also on certain observations I've made. For instance, for, for instance, that clumping you thought was so awful in high school. You say that you even dreaded to walk into class. You see what you did? You dropped out of school. You gave up an education because of a clump, which as far as I know was practically non-existent. A little physical defect is what you have, hardly noticeable even, magnified a thousand times by imagination. You know what my strong advice to you is? Think of yourself as superior in some way. In what way would I think? Why, man alive, Laura, just look about you a little. What do you see? A world full of common people, and all of them born, and all of them going to die. Which of them has one-tenth of your good points, or mine, or anyone else's as far as that goes? Gosh, everybody excels in some one thing, some in many. All you've got to do is discover in what. Take me, for instance. My interest happens to lie in electrodynamics. I'm taking a course in radio engineering at night school, Laura, on top of a fairly responsible job at the warehouse. I'm I'm taking that course of study and I'm taking that course and studying public speaking. Oh, because I believe in the future of television. I wish to be ready to go up right along with it. Therefore, I'm planning to get in on the ground floor. In fact, I've already made the right connections and all that remains is for the industry itself to get underway. Full steam, knowledge, zip money, zip power. That's the cycle democracy is built on. I guess you think I think a lot of myself. No, oh, I, now how about you? Isn't there something you take more interest in than anything else? Well, I do, as I said, have my glass collection. 
I, I'm, I'm not right sure I heard what you're talking about. What, what kind of glass is it? Little articles of it. They're ornaments, mostly. Most of them are little animals made out of glass, the tiniest little animals in the world. Mother calls them a glass menagerie. Here's an example of one, if, if you'd like to see it. This one is one of the oldest. It's nearly 13. Oh, be careful. If you breathe, it breaks. I, I'd better not take it. I'm pretty clumsy with things. Go on. I trust you with them. There now. You're holding him gently. Hold him over the light. He loves the light. You see how the light shines through him? It sure does shine. I shouldn't be partial, but he is my favorite one. What kind of thing is this supposed to be? Haven't you noticed the single horn on his forehead? A unicorn, huh? Mm-hmm. Unicorns, aren't they extinct in the modern world? I know. Poor little fellow, he must feel sort of lonesome. Well, if he does, he doesn't complain about it. He stays right on the shelf with some horses that don't have horns, and all of them seem to get along nicely together. How do you know? I haven't heard any arguments among them. No arguments, huh? Well, that's a pretty good sign. Where shall I set him? Put him put him on the table. They all like a change of scenery once in a while. Well, 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 well. Look how big my shadow is when I stretch. Oh, yes, it stretches across the ceiling. I think it stopped raining. What? Where does the music come from? From the Paradise Dance Hall across the alley. How about cutting a little rug, Miss Wingfield? Oh, I... Or is your program filled up? Let me have a look at it. Why, every dance is taken. I'll just have to scratch some out. Ah, a waltz. I can't dance. There you go, that inferiority stuff. I've never danced in my life. Come on, try. Oh, but I'd step on you. I'm not made of glass. How, um, how, how, how do we start? Just leave it to me. You hold your arms out a little. Like this? A little bit higher, right? Now, don't tighten up. That's the main thing about it. Relax. It's, it's hard not to. Okay. I'm afraid you can't budge me. What do you bet I can't? Goodness, yes, you can. Let yourself go now, Laura. Just let yourself go. I'm... Come on, trying. Not so stiff. Easy does it. I know, but I'm loosen the backbone. There, now, that's a lot better. Am I? Lots, lots better. Oh, my. Oh, my goodness. What, what did we hit on? Table. Did something fall off of it? I think, yes. I hope that it wasn't the little glass horse with the horn. Yes. Oh. Oh, is it broken? Now it's just like all the other horses. It's lost its horn. It doesn't matter. Maybe it's a blessing in disguise. You'll never forgive me. I bet that was your favorite piece of glass. I, I don't have favorites much. It's no tragedy. Freckles, glass breaks so easily, no matter how careful you are. The traffic jars that shelves and things fall off them. Still, I'm awfully sorry that I was the cause. I'll just imagine he had an operation. The horn was removed to make him feel less freakish. Now he will feel more at home with the other horses, the ones that don't have horns. <laughs> that was very funny. I'm glad to see you have a sense of humor. You know, you're, well, very different, surprisingly different from anyone else I know. Do you mind me telling you that? I mean it in a nice way. You make me feel sort of, I don't know how to put it. I'm usually pretty good at expressing things, but this is something that I don't know how to say. Has anyone ever told you that you were pretty? Well, you are in a very different way from anyone else. All the nicer because of the difference too. I wish that you were my sister. I teach you to have some confidence in yourself. That different people are not like other people, but being different is nothing to be ashamed of because other people are not such wonderful people. They're 100 times 1,000. You're one times one. They walk all over the earth. You just stay here. They're common as weeds, but you, well, you're blue roses.
but blue is wrong for roses. It's right for you. You're pretty. In what respect am I pretty? In all the respects, believe me, your eyes, your hair are pretty. Your hands are pretty. You think I'm making this up because I'm invited to dinner and I have to be nice. Oh, I could do that. I could put an act on for you, Laura, and say lots of things without being very sincere. But this time I am. I'm talking to you sincerely. I happen to notice you have this inferiority complex that keeps you from feeling comfortable with people. Somebody needs to build your confidence up and make you proud instead of shy and turning away and blushing. Somebody ought to kiss you, Laura. Ah, stumble, John. I, I shouldn't have done that. That was way off the beam. You, you don't smoke, do you? Would you care for a mint? Peppermint? Lifesaver? Lifesaver? My pockets are a regular drugstore. Wherever I go... Laura, you know, if I had a sister like you, I'd do the same thing as Tom. I'd bring out fellows and introduce her to them. The right type of boys. A type to appreciate her. Only, well, he made a mistake about me. Maybe I've got no call to be saying this. That, that may not have been the idea in having me over. But what if it was? There's nothing wrong about that. The only trouble is that, in my case, I'm not in a situation to do the right thing. I can't take down your number and say I'll phone. I can't call up next week and ask for a date. I thought I had better explain the situation in case you misunderstood it and, and I hurt your feelings. You won't call again? No, Laura, I can't. As I was just explaining, I've, I've got strings on me, Laura. I've been going steady. I go out all the time with a girl named Betty. She's a home girl like you and Catholic and Irish and in a great many ways we get along fine. I met her last summer on a moonlight boat trip up the river to Alton on the Majestic. Well, right away from the start, it was love. Being in love has made a new man of me. The power of love is really pretty tremendous. Love is something that changes the whole world, Laura. It happened that Betty's aunt took sick and she got a wire and had to go to Centralia. So Tom, when he asked me to dinner, I naturally just accepted the invitation, not knowing that you, that he, that I, I'm a stumble, John. I wish you would say something. What, what are you doing that for? You want me to, you want me to have him, Laura? What for? A souvenir. Well, 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 isn't the air delightful after a shower? I've made you children a little liquid refreshment. Jim, do you know that song about lemonade? Lemonade, lemonade, made in the shade and stirred with a spade. Good enough for any old maid? <laughs> no, I, I never heard it. Why, Laura, you look so serious. We were just having a serious conversation. Good, now, now you're better acquainted. <laughs> yes. You modern young people are much more serious-minded than my generation. I was so gay as a girl. You haven't changed, Mrs. Wing Mrs. Wingfield. Tonight I'm rejuvenated. The gaiety of the occasion, Mr. O'Connor. Oh, I'm baptizing myself. Here, let me. There now. I discovered we had some maraschino cherries. I dumped them in, juice and all. You shouldn't have gone to that trouble, Mrs. Wingfield. Trouble? Trouble? Why, it was loads of fun. Didn't you hear me cutting up in the kitchen? I bet your ears were burning. I told Tom how outdone with him I was for keeping him to him for keeping you to himself for so long a time. He should have brought you over much, much sooner. Well, now that you've found your way, I want you to be a very frequent caller. Not just occasional, but all the time. Oh, we're going to have a lot of gay times together. I see them coming. Mm, just breathe that air so fresh and the moon so pretty. I'll skip back out. I know where my place what place is when young folks are having a, a serious conversation. Oh, don't don't go out, Mrs. Wingfield. The fact of the matter is I, I've got to be going. Going? Now? You're joking. Why, it's only the shank of the evening, Mr. O'Connor. Well, you you know how it is. You mean you, you're a working, you're a young working man and have to keep working man's hours? Well, we'll let you off early tonight, but only on the condition that next time you stay later. What's the best night for you? Isn't Saturday, isn't Saturday night the best night for you working man? I have a couple of time clocks to punch, Mrs. Wingfield. One at morning and another one at night. 
my, but you are ambitious. Work at night, too? No, ma'am. Not work, but Betty. Betty? Betty? Who's Betty? Oh, just just a girl. The, the girl I go steady with. Oh, is it a serious romance, Mr. O'Connor? Oh, we're going to be married the second Sunday in June. Oh, how nice. Tom didn't mention that you were engaged to be married. The cat's not out of the bag at the warehouse yet. You, you know how they are. They call you Romeo and stuff like that. It's been a wonderful evening, Mrs. Wingfield. I, I guess that is what I mean to... I guess this is what they mean by Southern hospitality. It really wasn't anything at all. I hope I don't seem like I'm rushing off, but I promised Betty I'd pick her up at the, Wab at the Wabash Dip Depot, and by the time I get my jalopy down there, her train will be in. Some women are pretty upset if you keep them waiting. Yes, I know, the tyranny of women. Goodbye, Mr. O'Connor. I wish you luck and happiness and success, all three of them, and so does Laura. Don't you, Laura? Yes. Goodbye, Laura. I'm certainly going to treasure that souvenir, and don't forget the good advice I gave you. So long, Shakespeare. Thanks again, ladies. Good night. Things have a way of turning out so badly, I don't believe that I would play the Victrola. Well, 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 our gentleman caller was engaged to be married. Tom? Yes, mother? Come in here a minute. I want to tell you something awfully funny. Has the gentleman caller gotten away already? The gentleman caller has made an early departure. What a wonderful joke you played on us. What do you mean? You didn't mention that he was engaged to be married. Jim, engaged? That's what he just informed us. I'll be jiggered. I didn't know about that. That seems very peculiar. What's peculiar about it? Didn't you call him your best friend down at the warehouse? He is, but how did I know? It seems extremely peculiar that you wouldn't know your best friend was going to be married. The warehouse is where I work, not where I know things about people. You don't know things anywhere. You live in a dream. You manufacture illusions. Where are you going? I'm going to the movies. That's right. Now that you've had us make such fools of ourselves, the effort, the preparation, all the expense, the new floor lamp, the rug, the clothes for Laura, all for what? To entertain some other girl's fiance. Go to the movies, go. Don't think about us. A mother deserted, an unmarried sister who's crippled and has no job. Don't let anything interfere with your selfish pleasure. Just go. Go to the movies. All right, I will. The more you shout about my selfishness the, to, to me, the quicker I'll run, and I won't go to the movies. Go then. Go to the moon, you selfish dreamer. I didn't go to the moon. I went much further. For time is the longest distance between two places. Not long after that, I was fired for writing a poem on the lid of a shoebox. I left St. Louis. I descended the steps of this fire escape for the last time and followed from then on in my father's footsteps, attempting to find in motion what was lost in space. I traveled around a great deal. The city swept about me like dead leaves, leaves that were brightly colored but torn away from the branches. I would have stopped, but I was pursued by something. It always came upon me unawares, taking me altogether by surprise. Perhaps it was a familiar bit of music. Perhaps it was the only piece of transparent glass. Perhaps I am walking along the street at night in some strange city before I have found companions. I pass the lighted window of a shop where perfume is sold. The window is filled with pieces of colored glass, tiny transparent bottles, and delicate colors like bits of shattered rainbow. Then all at once my sister touches my shoulder. I turn around and look her in the eyes. Oh, Laura. Laura, I, I tried to leave you behind me, but I am more faithful than I intended to be. I reach for a cigarette. I cross the street. I run into the movies or a bar. I buy a drink. I speak to the nearest stranger, anything that can blow your candles out. For nowadays, the world is lit by lightning. Blow out your candles, Laura. And so, goodbye. And that will do it for Tennessee Williams, The Glass Menagerie, a play. Uh, kind of difficult to get through, 
uh, something new here at Carla Reads the Classics. I hope you were able to follow along and get some meaning through what was happening, uh, hearing one voice play all the characters. But it was a fun read. I, I do hope that you were able to get something from it. Um, thank you again for joining me here at Carla Reads the Classics. Until next time. If you didn't realize it, this is a totally free podcast. How does Carla do it? Well, she loves to read the classics, but we all could use a little help now and then. So if you'd like to show your appreciation, any small donation would be appreciated. Visit anchor.fm slash Carla 3507 or cash app dollar sign Jess TSM.